Well, good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our first service his day at Cromer Parish Church. It's lovely to have you with us, uh, whether you're one of our regular members here or whether you are visiting us on holiday or whether you are joining us on the live stream. However you are worshipping with us, it's lovely to have you with us. Uh, my name is Will, I'm the vicar of Cromer, and later on in our service, Joanna, our curate, is going to be opening up for us one of the accounts of the risen Lord Jesus uh, meeting with his followers. And we look forward to uh, having our hearts warmed by that later on. But as we begin, we say the greeting. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn. It's 442 in the hymn books. Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
We sit or kneel as we continue in prayer. Shall our hearts forget his promise we sing, I am with you evermore. That is the Lord's words to us. He is with us uh, by his spirit. And knowing that, we pray together the collect for purity. We say, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. For on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Our hymn reminded us that Jesus is the friend of sinners. So knowing that wonderful truth, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. Firmly resolve to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all, we say. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We stand to praise God in the words of the glory. Let us pray. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, give us, we pray, such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sit to listen to God's word. reading this morning is taken from the book of Acts to be found on page 1095 in the church bibles Acts chapter 3 I'm beginning to read at verse 11 while the man held on to Peter and John all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's colonnade When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed and you disowned him before Pilate though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you all can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders, but this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that time of refreshment may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah, who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Our Gospel reading this morning is taken from the Gospel according to Luke, to be found on page 1062 in the Church Bibles, beginning to read at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. (laughs) A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the Gospel of Christ. Lord, as we come before you, we pray that you 
who will help us to listen what you re to what you really want to say to us. So open our ears and our eyes and our minds, so we truly see you in all your resurrection glory. Amen. Please do sit down. I think you can probably hear me now. I feel a bit, I feel a bit boomy. Am I, am I too, am I okay? Yep. Yeah. Well, this morning, we begin by observing some events in Jerusalem from a very, very safe distance, one of 2,000 years. Unlike the disciples who were living in what must have seemed at the time like something of a nightmare. This small group of men and women had locked themselves in an upper room after experiencing the extreme torture, uh, uh, trauma of watching their friend arrested, then tortured, and then killed. They were frozen in their grief, in the trauma of the previous few days, in the loss of their dreams, for the loss of their promised Messiah. So they huddle together behind locked doors, terrified that the authorities will come after them next. Well, I suppose that's not really surprising. We, from this safe distance, have the benefit of knowing what happens next. They didn't. So let's think back to the events of the last few days before this first day of the week. Try to imagine yourself in their shoes. Try to put aside what you know. So they'd seen their leader, the one in whom they put so much hope, the one whom they thought was going to free them from the clutches of worldly empires. They'd seen him hounded by the Roman-appointed temple authorities, questioned, beaten, and sentenced to death. Then they'd witnessed his parading through the streets and his public execution as an enemy of the state, all the time wondering, were they to be next? In your shoes, in their shoes, what would you have done? I think I would have retreated and locked myself in a room well away from everybody. No wonder they shut themselves in. No wonder they denied Jesus. No wonder they had deserted him. It's because they are fearful. And the natural human response to fear, especially fear of the unknown, is to retreat to familiar surroundings, to be with familiar people, people to whom you don't need to explain your fears, people who share your fears, and then to lock the door. Of course, they'd heard reports of Jesus being alive, of having been raised from the dead, even though they had seen him being killed. The women had come back from the tomb just that morning saying, an angel, or angels in Luke's reversion, had told them he was risen. But the male disciples had dismissed it as women's nonsense. Then Simon Peter said he'd seen him, and they were just talking with the two who'd returned from Emmaus, who were full of joy and excitement. They'd met and talked and eaten with Jesus, they said. And then, in that locked room, in the midst of them, Jesus came and stood among them. But when they saw Jesus for themselves, they're still not ready, they're still not prepared. And Luke tells us that they were startled. I would think that was possibly a little bit of an understatement. And they were terrified. I know that I would have been terrified. I know that I would have been fearful. I know I would have been disbelieving. Fear does that to you. It closes our mind to possibilities, to the future. Fear and anxiety take the color out of life. Life becomes like a negative. You remember those little pieces of film we used to get with printed photographs, where everything is reversed. Dark is light and light is dark. And it's really difficult to see the detail and the fullness of the picture. 
Jesus' first words to them are, peace be with you. Shalom, he says, a word imbued with meaning, a word they knew well. Not just peace as an absence of conflict, not just peace as a calming emotion. Shalom, peace as salvation. Jesus knows that they are desperately in need of peace, his peace. He understands and then challenges their fears. Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your minds? I mean, what a question. Hadn't Jesus realized the impact the last few days had had on them all? Of course they doubted, of course they'd been troubled, of course they were fearful. It must just have seemed like the end of the world. Well, it was the end of the world as they knew it. But the resurrected, transformed Jesus meets them where they are and acknowledges their fear. But then, but then, he moves them beyond where they are and invites them to look, to really look, to really see, to touch and see that he is Jesus. It's, uh, it is I myself. It's me, he said. I am. But even then, even though joy and amazement had replaced the fear, they still did not really, really believe it. Again, I think we can relate to that. Our hearts may have greeted the risen Lord Jesus with great joy, but our feeble minds, well, so often they want a logical explanation. This really can't be. I mean, really? How? But Jesus, still moving them forward, opens their eyes, and then he opens their minds, and he talks to them. Do you remember what I told you about all this? Do you? That the scripture would be fulfilled, that all that was prophesied in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms would come to pass through me. That my death and suffering had to happen, and then I would rise from the dead on the third day. Do you remember me saying that? Jesus opened their minds that death was not to have the last word. He did that by talking to them. He did that by being there. That the powers of this earth, imperial or otherwise, are not the end of the story. And all at once, they knew and they really understood about God's new world, about his new creation. And they understood that the kingdom of God here on earth was coming. And that it was coming because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Because of the cross. Because of God's plan. Because of God's eternal love for us. And then, and then Jesus gives them that commission, that command, that they're not to stay there in that locked room. But they're to go out into all the world as witnesses of the good news, of the joy. Yes, they were to be rooted in scripture, but active in mission, to paraphrase Tom Wright. Just as Jesus had done, they were to do. They were to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to all nations, bringing the whole world into the embrace of God's saving and healing love. This is what the disciples have been prepared for in the three years that they were with Jesus, this moment. And their time had now come. The seeds are being sown, which will come to fruition at Pentecost with the gift of the Holy Spirit, that power from on high. Now for us, all this we know. But do we just know it as head knowledge? Because so often we find it hard to escape from our own fears. We all have our own upper rooms with doors firmly locked. In this country, we're not likely to be physically persecuted for our faith 
although that's not the case across the world, as our prayer diary so powerfully reminds us this month. No, our fears are much more likely to be personal. Fears of loneliness or unemployment or ill health or loss. Or they may be played out on a more national level with fear of attack or pandemic or a breakdown of community. Or on a global level. And who can avoid being fearful about what is happening in our world today? And when we despair at the growing number of conflicts and of wars in Gaza, Ukraine, Sudan, Yemen, and only last night, we add Iran and Israel to that list. And underlying all those fears is the fear of death itself, our own or that of a loved one. So often, fears play on us, closing in on us. But I mean, of course, we all want to feel safe. We all want to feel secure from whatever threatens, we feel threatens us. And so often, that means that we hide behind our own locked doors. It may make us feel more secure, but we're still left there with our fear and our mistrust of whatever has driven us there. Our fears can then hold us captive. And then when that happens, it becomes really, really difficult to be witnesses to the great joy that is ours, that Jesus is alive, that death has been defeated, and Jesus has overcome it all. The power of the, res res the, power of the resurrection is the transformation that it brings of individuals, of communities, of the world. Jesus, in his resurrected body, is transformed. And he invites his disciples, and that's all of us, to also be transformed. And then to plant seeds of transformation throughout the world. The closed minds of those first disciples were open through seeing Jesus, touching him, eating with him, and through hearing the scriptures. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. They could understand Jesus' place and their place in them. Jesus was present with his disciples and in his word. And Jesus remains present with us through the power of the Holy Spirit and through his word. And yet, and yet if we are trapped by our fears, by our feelings of inadequacy, if we are trapped by our minds remaining closed, how are we to be the witnesses we are called to be? Could our desire for security actually be working against that peace that we and the world so badly need? Dorothy Sowell, born in Germany in 1929, wrote about the horrors of the concentration camps and the inadequacy and inability of the church at the time to have prevented it. Her theological reflections challenged the human propensity to want to feel safe, to feel <coughs> secure from any threat. And she does that by seeking that security from God. In her essay, entitled Peace, Not Security, she says, change happens <laughs> at the level of action that contain risk. Change happens at the level of action that contains risk. And then she goes on to say, because you are strong in Christ, you can put the human neurotic need for security behind you. When Jesus appeared in the midst of the disciples, he changed their lives. He moved them from fear to joy, albeit mixed with belief, disbelief and puzzlement, to an open and understanding mind and heart. He opened their eyes 
and their minds and their hearts. And if we let him, he'll do it for us too. From the frightened and locked in to willing risk takers witnessing the risen Christ. We see this in our reading from Acts this morning, where just a few weeks later, a risk-taking Peter challenges the crowd, preaching repentance, assuring forgiveness and healing in Jesus' name. Oh yes, they were confident of their calling, of their faith, leading them to risk all to be his witnesses. Their security came from God. Through Jesus being in their midst, they had understood that he had conquered that ultimate threat, death, and that their fears were now groundless. Peace, shalom, salvation became reality in their lives. The challenge for us is great. We are so used to seeking security, to wanting to feel safe, to preserve what we have and our own small piece of the world. So what does it look like for us, for peace, shalom, salvation, to become a reality in our lives? How do we model that gift of open eyes and hearts and minds? Think for a moment of where in our communities we need to see that gift, that presence of the risen Christ. What doors of fear need unlocking? What growth, what letting go, what action, what opening of our minds do we need if we are to be credible witnesses to God's saving love and grace in the world? Where do we need to take risks in order to enact change? And not just as individuals, but how as a church, as the body of Christ, are we to participate in God's work, his mission here? How are we to be rooted in scripture and active in mission? Are we, as a church, strong in Christ, able to put our need for worldly security to one side and trust in God's provision? But however we individually and corporately answer these questions, Jesus has commissioned us to declare God's presence even where there is tragedy or despair or fear. And he promises us, the Holy Spirit, the clothing of power from on high. So whilst our world may sometimes feel as though it's falling apart, God desires to bring peace, love, hope, truth and unity. And we are called to speak words of peace both in sharp challenge and abundant forgiveness, in order that we can all live life in all its fullness, in full colour. And we know that it is only through repentance and forgiveness, both individually and corporately, that this hope can be realised. Jesus commissions us to be witnesses to that hope to be that hope. So let's put our fears away, unlock the doors to our hearts and minds, opening our eyes and minds to the possibility to a future where God's new creation lives and lives in the way we love, the way we speak, the way we act, so that peace, shalom, salvation, becomes a reality for all. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your patience with us, as so often we run from you and do not put our trust in you. We know that you long for us to love all your people. So give us courage to put away our fears, to put our trust in you and to be your witnesses as we proclaim your love calling others to turn to follow Jesus, living a new life. Give us open eyes to truly see, open minds which truly understand, and hearts that are truly open. May we know true shalom. Amen.
Joanna, thank you so much for helping us think through that passage. We are going to respond now by standing to affirm together with Christians down the ages and across the world the truths that we own as Christian believers. So let's stand. And we say together, We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen, We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Do please sit or kneel as we continue in a time of prayer. And when I say, Lord, in your mercy, if you could respond, hear our prayer. So in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ... Let us pray to our loving Heavenly Father. We pray for the Church of Christ, and especially for our congregation here at Cromer, that we may be bold and faithful witnesses of all the things that Jesus has done. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Graham and Jane and Ian, our bishops in this diocese, Uh, for Justin and Stephen, our archbishops, and indeed for the whole Church of England, that we might be united in faith and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Charles, our King, and Kate, Princess of Wales, and all our royal family. We pray for Rishi Sunak, our Prime Minister, and indeed all the leaders of the nations, and those who are in authority. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our town of Cromer and for all the people who live here and for those who visit on holiday.
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our farmers, for good weather, and for abundant harvests. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are sick or suffering, uh, frightened or troubled or doubting, that they may know the power and the peace of the risen Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, that when we meet in his name and we pray according to his will, he will be among us and hear our prayer. And so, in your love and mercy, we pray, fulfill our petitions and give us, we ask, that greatest gift, which is to know you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand. Our passage reminds us that while the disciples were talking about all that they had seen, Jesus himself stood among them and he said to them, Peace be with you. So may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share with one another a sign of that peace. Well, at the moment, we're going to uh, share in the Lord's Supper together, but as we uh, prepare to do so, we're going to remain standing to sing again. We sing uh, hymn 203 in ancient and modern, 203. Good Christians all rejoice and sing.
As we come to the Lord's Table, let me just give you a few words of instruction. We welcome all those to the Lord's Table who are baptized and who love the Lord Jesus. If you're used to sharing in uh, bread and wine in your own church family, then you're very welcome to do so uh, here as well. Uh, We've got a range of options on the table. The bread that we're using this morning is uh, gluten-free bread, so if you have a gluten intolerance, you can receive it comfortably. Uh, But we have a choice between the common cup and individual cups, and also between the normal alcoholic wine and non-alcoholic wine. If you could just make your preference known to those who are serving, then they'd be delighted to serve you in the way that is appropriate uh, for you. Uh, If you're using the individual cups, if I could ask you to drop them once you're finished with them in the uh, little boxes at the end of the communion rail, uh, that's a great help to us when it comes to tidying up at the end of the service. But as we gather together as the Lord's people, we remind ourselves that the Lord is here and his spirit is with us. So friends, lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is indeed right. It is our duty and our joy at all times and in all places to give you thanks and praise, Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. So therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Accept our praises, Heavenly Father, through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And as we follow his example and obey his command, grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember his offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom. And with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your Son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Accept through him, our great high priest, this our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, inspire us with your love, and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, With all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. Blessing and honour and glory and power be yours forever and ever. Amen. We sit or kneel as we continue in prayer. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. So friends, draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he gave for you, and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith, 
with thanksgiving. Amen.
So having broken bread together, let's pray this prayer of thanksgiving. We say, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, we are going to stand to sing again a great uh, hymn uh, which reminds us that Jesus is the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. We stand to sing 742. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's stand.
Well, the moment I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing, but just before then, just a few things to uh, draw to your particular attention that are happening in the life of the church family over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the first is this evening at 6.30 up at St. Martin's, we've got uh, the next in our Roots uh, series. We're uh, thinking about a number of the great doctrines of the Christian faith, and this evening, uh, contrary to what's being advertised, we're thinking about the doctrine of God. Uh, who is God? What is he like? And, uh, and how can we know him? So I hope that you can join us for that. There will be cake. I forgot last week, but uh, last time, but I promise uh, this month uh, there will be cake. So maybe that's an incentive for you to come. That's 6.30 up at St. Martin's. And then on uh, Thursday this week, uh, Thursday the 18th of April, 7.30 here in the parish church, uh, we are hosting uh, Gresham's School Senior Chamber Choir. They're giving a concert of vocal music. Uh, including I hear several pieces by uh, Stanford. Uh, promises to be an excellent evening and you're welcome to come. Uh, the admission is uh, free uh, with a retiring collection. That's 7.30 uh, this Thursday uh, here in the parish church. And lastly, but by no means least, uh, next week, Thursday the 25th of April at 7.30 at St. Martin's, we have our annual uh, church meeting. Uh, that's an opportunity for us to look back and give thanks to the Lord for all his graciousness to us over the last year and also to look forward. It's also an opportunity for us to elect our church wardens and three members uh, to serve on the parochial church council. Uh, if you're willing to, or wishing to stand uh, for election, then nomination papers for those roles uh, are available on request from our PCC secretary, uh, Mary Howard. So if you think you might be able to stand... Uh, for those roles, then do give that some thought and some prayer. Uh, as always, we've got tea and coffees served at the back, so we pray that you're able to stay with us uh, to share in fellowship with us. Let me pray a prayer of blessing as we close there. So the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and all those for whom we pray, this day and always. Amen. So friends, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>